All right, so today we're going to pick up somewhat where we left off, talking about how, how we take data in physics experiments, and, and especially in optics lab, but this generalizes to, to, to bigger and fancier physics experiments, uh, you know, all the way up to Large Hadron Collider experiments and these big cosmic microwave background experiments I've been involved in. The same kind of ways of thinking about data fitting and error analysis. It's just that instead of doing things five times, we do them thousands of times. And instead of taking only seven knob settings, we take thousands or millions of knob settings. You know, each pixel in a in a picture is is a kind of a different setting in, in X and Y space. But all of the same statistical ideas apply. Uh, and uh, we use all the same Python tools to do the data analysis. So this generalizes quite, quite well. So let me review what, what we sort of talked about last time, which was that in general, in an optics lab experiment, maybe you have some knob that you're turning, say x, and some value you're measuring, say y. And you, you have some theory that there should be some line here linking x and y. And what you end up doing is you make, you turn the knob to a bunch of different settings. And you know, in optics lab, it's sort of on the order of 10, 10 settings. I'm only going to draw three. Um, and and you, for each setting, you, you make a measurement. You go to the next setting, and you make a measurement. And you go to the next setting, and make a measurement. Go to the next setting, and make a measurement. And then you go back, maybe to the beginning, or you randomize the order that you're doing these. Um, uh, the goal is you don't, you don't want to go to the same setting over and over and over again, because if you slightly screwed up your turning of the knob, um, you don't want that slight screw up to be the same for every time you take this measurement. Uh, but you know, say you repeat this process uh, five times, which is our normal, our normal number of times, and for for every point in x, you'll get five numbers in y. And we talked about last time how you can calculate the the sample mean, and the sample mean becomes a data point here. So let's say that you get that that sample mean. And say that sample mean, and say, you know, this sample mean way up here for, for this x. That's not exactly in line. Um, and I hinted at how how we how we draw the, the error bars on this, but I'll, I'll get to that in a second. Let me remind you what the model is for for how we expect these data points to appear. So every time you draw a sample from your distribution, we expect that you're drawing from something that looks either like a Gaussian or it, you know, by the time you average things together, it'll look pretty Gaussian. But let's just say that the, uh, the probability distribution for drawing any particular y value looks like a Gaussian, one over square root of two pi sigma squared with some true standard deviation, sigma, e to the minus y minus mu, some true mean for that particular value, oops, for that particular knob setting, that particular x, the, the true mean is going to vary depending on your, your model, or depending on what's, maybe not your model, depending on what's really going on in the real world, your true mean is going to vary. And uh, divided by two sigma squared, that's the, the probability. And let me just remind you what, what this looks like and the interpretation of sigma. I sort of hinted at this and many of you probably know it, but if you have, some, some y, and this is my p of y. A Gaussian sort of ends up looking like this. Uh, that is not a very good Gaussian. Let me redraw the Gaussian. Gaussian sort of looks like this. It's going to be centered around some true mean mu. And what is one sigma? Well, one sigma is, is that and if we were to ask what fraction of the data points are between minus one sigma and plus one sigma, uh, what fraction of the, the points that you draw out of this distribution, uh, that number is about 68%. And we can ask the same thing. That's that's the integral of, of all these um, all this area and the probability curve. We could ask the same thing about two sigma. So if I integrate out the two sigma here then 95% of the points are within two sigma of the true mean. And we can even ask about three sigma. 
And uh, for that, it is, oops. Ninety-nine point seven percent of the points are within three sigma, and if you're a particle physicist, you might even go out to five sigma, or it's like a one in a million or a more uh, chance that you end up outside of that that range. So, so this is the the Gaussian distribution. Let's remember what this is. This is the distribution for drawing a single measurement um, from a particular knob setting, and the reason why Gaussian is usually a good model is because there are many different errors that contribute to that. Not only can you screw up your, you know, actually setting the knob uh, exactly right, but you know, when you make a measurement, there's, there's always electrical noise or uh, thermal noise. And you might just read something slightly incorrectly you know, if it's an analog ruler or meter. Uh, but you know, the, the cumulative effect of a lot of little errors, the central limit theorem claims gives, gives us a Gaussian distribution. Prof. Jason, I think you're missing a squared in your y minus mu up at the top. I am indeed missing a squared. Thank you. Thank you for saving my, my lecture again. Um, okay. So um, what, what we want to know, though, for, for putting error bars on this plot is, is not uh, kind of what is the spread if I were to move the knob to a particular position and take another, uh, another measurement. You know, that, that's a useful thing to know, but that's, that's not really what we want in terms of error bars on this plot. We wanna know is when we put the knob here and take five measurements and form their mean, what is the spread of those means? If I were to do that procedure um, you know, a bajillion times where I, I take five measurements, take their average, take another five measurements, take their average, take another five measurements, take their average. What is the spread in those averages? And that is, that is the error bar that we want to put on the plot. And let me draw some, some other Gaussians here. Um, as, you, as you might imagine, that really depends on how, how many measurements you take. So if you were to take just one measurement, uh, then I don't know if that's even a reasonable thing to to, to call a spread, but uh, you certainly can't estimate it from just having taken one measurement. But for one measurement, you would get a spread of uh, that's just p of y. It's the same as the same as the one above. Um, if you were to take more than one measurement, I should have left myself more room here. Let me leave myself a little bit more room. Uh, So I just I just wanted to redraw the same same Gaussian histogram. Let's see where is my screen cut off? Yeah, somewhere around here. I'm not sure about others, but my screen is a little cut off. Uh, you, you see the horizontal line there? Yeah, I'll 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 write a little bit higher. And, and Jason, just to revisit, there was a question in the chat. The, the Gaussian is the probability of what again? This Gaussian here. Uh, so this Gaussian that I drew here, so far all I've talked about is the, maybe the probability of getting a particular Y measurement. So let's call this X1, X2, X3. Those are your knob settings. Let's just take this middle point as an example. So just to be very concrete, this is the probability distribution of uh, measurements you would make when you set the knob to position two. Um, it would look like that, and this would be the true mean you expect at position two. Whatever the actual uh, actual uh, theory of the the universe would say you should get when you set your knob to to this this value. That's the that would be the true mean. But due to uncertainties and where you set that knob and and noise and everything else. Um, you make your measurement and they won't all be exactly where the universe says you should be getting it. They'll be slightly distributed around that. And the probability distribution uh, for that would be, would be this. Maybe, I don't know why I picked two. Let's just call this I in general. Or maybe subscript N, I think I called it last time. 
I actually have a, a follow-up technical question, Jason, and th I, this is probably beyond the scope of what we're going to do, but in principle, sigma could also be varying with the non-positions, right? Uh, yes, that, that's true, we, too. Uh, why we, won't not? Be we probably won't be treating that in this class. Is that right? Uh, nothing I will say will depend on sigma being the same. So cool. Uh, yeah, thank you. I should have I should have made this quite general here. Um, yeah, I guess I was leaving off the subscripts to imply that this applied, you know, for every every single y. But it, keep, keeping them on is is maybe useful because there's there is a different a different width of the distribution, perhaps for different uh, different places, and that that's that's all fine. That we, we will we will track that all the way through the curve fitting and everything. So so yeah, you have to keep track of each of those uh, separately. Uh, and and the Python fitting routines and everything, you you will give it a a different error bar for every every knob position, every uh, independent variable position. Okay, so what I was going to draw is I'm going to redraw this this curve as as the probability distribution for yeah, I'm having trouble drawing convincing looking Gaussians today. Uh, redraw this curve for a single measurement. So let me call this uh, P of Y uh, sub N. So this is your, your uh, uh, the distribution and its spread sigma sub N for you know, having gone back to some position and making the next measurement. That's, that's what this would look like. But if you take five measurements at every point and average them together, you expect that the average is closer to the mean than any individual uh, measurement would be. And so the, there's a much narrower distribution, which uh, again, by the central limit theorem, if you have a, a sum of independent things, and since these are each independent measurements, uh, you, you have a, a sum of independent draws from this Gaussian, it's, it's also gonna be a Gaussian. That Gaussian is gonna be narrower. It's gonna have the same mean it's not a great Gaussian, but I'm saying it's a Gaussian. It has the same mean, but a, a narrower, uh, narrower distribution. And the, the sigma for this new Gaussian is what I called last time sigma sub y bar. And, and maybe I should call this uh, y bar, again, for the nth uh, knob position, if we want to be really uh, careful about it. The last time I just focused the whole lecture on, you know, going over and over again to the same knob position. So I didn't bother putting the subscripts everywhere. But maybe since we're going to talk about curve fitting, I should be a little bit more careful. And the the more measurements you take, the narrower and narrower this histogram becomes. And you know, in the limit where you take millions and millions of measurements, you, the average should should really really be extremely narrowly converged on. On the on the true mean here, but you know it, it depends on the number of measurements. And I made the claim last time that this sigma uh, sigma y bar, the standard uh, standard error on the mean, that this was. Uh, well, let me let me actually write this on the plot here so we can keep it for later. So each data point is y bar for that particular data point. So that's y bar sub one. And the error bars that we're going to draw on this, each side of those error bars is uh, sigma sub y bar sub one. So it's the standard, standard error, standard deviation um, on that mean. And this is equal to and this is a claim that I'll prove, actually. One, one over square root of n times the, uh, times the standard deviation, sigma sub n. And this is, in, in practice, in data taking, you don't, you don't have access to the true, uh, the, the true mean, and you don't have access to the true sigma. So we're going to estimate this. This is you know, true on average. We're going to estimate this as 1 over square root of n times this s sub n, the, the sample 
standard deviation. Okay, so let me let me prove that this this one over square root of n makes some amount of sense here. I have a question, real quick. Yes. Uh, are these two different ends, the capital and the lowercase? Are they the same? Uh, uh, lowercase n is just an index. Am I am I taking? Okay. You know, is my knob set to the left, to the middle, or to the right? That's that's what lowercase n is. Uh, capital n is the number of measurements I take at each point, which in optics lab is generally five-ish. And here I've drawn three different data points. So each of these would come with its, with its errors and they don't all have to be the same. So you you could take a different number of measurements at each data point? Uh, it, you could. But you um, shouldn't? Well, I, I mean, it's a little bit confusing and harder to analyze, okay. I would say. Okay. Thanks. Uh, and well, I, I mean, I suppose if there's if there's some area where you know it's super noisy, that I don't see there any harm in taking more, more data there. But I to, to sort of get get the error here to be similar to the others. But I I say that in general that's not um, that's not particularly useful. It's probably better to take spend your time taking data where uh, where things are less noisy. I don't know. I think statistically it doesn't matter. You could sort of divide your time uh, in lots of different ways, and it doesn't doesn't make that big of a difference. You know, maybe like a second order difference in terms of how how accurately you're going to measure the the parameters of this line. Uh, but you know, in, in typical optics lab experiments, we we do five measurements uh, at each position to get a good estimate of the mean and a reasonable uh, error bars, and then we'll, we'll take, you know, I've only drawn three here, but we'll we'll do maybe 10, 10, uh, 10 different positions. And that's the sort of, you know, that, that takes a reasonable amount of time for us to do in the lab by hand. Uh, certainly if you had these things automated or, uh, well, if, if everything was automated, you could take a lot more of each type of measurement, you could do, do a lot more different independent ones and a lot more measurement at, at, at each point. Uh, five is kind of the minimum minimum you need to get a reasonable estimate of of these error bars. Uh, if you're if you're taking two or three, you're, you're sort of uncomfortably uh, uncomfortably low. Although statistically everything should work out just fine. I say that in practice, it's it's harder to tell if you screwed up. You know, for for example, if if you take five measurements and one of them is just wildly off, it's a lot easier to say, oh, you know, I I think. I think what happened was I read the, the millimeters instead of the inches this time. Uh, whereas if you're only taking two or three measurements, it's, it's really hard to find. Uh, I, I don't know what kind of error you would call those. Gross negligence errors. Um, so I, I don't know if, if Professor Bresnay or Elton have any other suggestions or advice through their vast experience of doing experimental physics. In terms of choosing capital N, Jason. Yes. Or, you know. Or yeah, the... I would just say keep it keep it simple. It, you'll go down a rabbit hole if you try to optimize what capital N is at every knob position. Yeah, yeah, and I I think those effects are quite small, second order effects. You know, so so basically, the the way an actual optics lab experiment works, you go in and you fiddle with it, and you sort of get a sense for okay, I want to take data from here to here. And each data point, you know, I can imagine takes me however many seconds to take and write down. And I've got about an hour left in class. So uh, if I want to do this, you know, five, five measurements per data point, that means I can take only seven data points, or that means I can take 25 data points, you know, whatever it is. And then, and then you figure out what you're going to do, and then you just go. So that's, that's the, uh, the very practical answer. And, and five is really the number that, that is, uh, that we encourage. And, and Jason, maybe just another thing to put on, on people's radar is, you know, there's this whole idea of adaptive sampling and, and p-hacking that comes into, you know, these questionable research practices, especially in other fields, where you wouldn't want to go about 
you know, selectively choosing your capital N based on whether or not it's proving or disproving the hypothesis you're trying to test if you're doing some hypothesis testing. Oh yeah, so, that's just straight up immoral. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I'm not, the, the question of if you happen to be in a region that's particularly noisy and you choose to make more measurements in that region, region I'm not sure that that is biased toward uh, confirming your hypothesis, but it's not, it's just not worth it. Prof Galicchio? Yes. Can you clarify what the uh, skinnier distribution is representing? Is it like a distribution of a set of averages of data points, or is it just like a distribution where there's, you took more data? Uh, so the blue is the distribution of a single measurement. The pink, is a distribution of the average of five measurements. It should be narrower by a factor of square root of n. And the greenish one is where I made n like 100 or whatever. I, you know, I, I took lots and lots and lots of measurements. I was just saying that this, the, the mean, uh, the distribution of each mean, when each mean is composed of 100 measurements, gets narrower and narrower and narrower as you take more and more measurements. Okay, cool. So it's a, it's a distribution of an average, right? Yeah, yeah. Oh, yes. So I, I wrote down the sigma, but I should really have written down that this is P of Y bar to the nth point. Yeah, thank you for thank you for asking that question. That's, that's what the distribution is. Just like this blue distribution is P of Y sub n, the distribution for a single measurement at that particular knob knob value. Um, okay, let me, let me talk about sort of, uh, let, let me take a step back and, and say something that's a little bit more general and will be more generally useful, but at least today we'll use it to, to prove this square root of n business, which is, the idea of, of propagation of error and how it comes just from uh, just from uh, uh, kind of a, thinking about things in a in terms of a Taylor series. So, so let's imagine that you have some some function uh, y say uh, well let's let's not call it y we've used y everywhere let's just say we we have some x and x is some function of u and v. And this function is, is kind of smooth. And say, say you, you make measurements of u and measurements of v, and each of those measurements comes with some, some uncertainty, and you want to know what is the uncertainty in x. And as long as this function is smooth, so imagine that you know, x is like the sum of u and v, or the product of u and v, or uh, you know, the ratio of u and v away from 0. As long, as long as this function is smooth, you can imagine that uh, drawing a bunch of u's if they're all kind of clustered around the true, the true mean for u, and then drawing a bunch of v's if they're all clustered around the true mean of v, uh, we can estimate small, the small fluctuations in x by doing a, a linear Taylor expansion. And so what we say is that to first order here, uh, small changes in in X are going to be uh, partial, partial X, partial U times the small changes in U plus partial X, partial V, whatever that function is, times those small fluctuations in V. Maybe I'll put a little thing on the B to make it clear. All right, so um, let's. Let's, uh, let's take that more, more seriously. And let's look at what the expression for, um, uh, let's look at what the expression for y bar is and what its, its function is. Uh, hold on, I, I wanted, I, I'm, I'm, I'm missing a step here. Uh, Uh, 
Uh, you and V represent like background noise that are changing our X or something. Um, no, it's it's more like uh, say you. Uh, what's what's the best example of of this? So I'll, I'll give I'll give a more concrete example in the in the context that we're gonna we're gonna use in a second. But let's just say you you make two measurements of two things and you want to you just form the sum of them. So you know for example, uh, x is just u plus v. That's our function. And measurements of u have some uncertainty associated with them. Measurements of v have some uncertainty associated associated with them. We'll assume that those uncertainties are, are uncorrelated in a second, but then you form the sum. And so uh, let's call that the calculation X that has some uncertainties associated with it. Can I ask a follow-up question, Jason? Yes. So before X corresponded to non-positions, is X now like an, an experimental output? Yeah, I, I changed this letter from my notes. Let's, uh, let's just call this some, some other random thing, F, F. F, F, F. Does that, does that help? Thank you. Sorry if people had to erase or rewrite or something. F, example F. F is just U plus B. So, so I measure U, I measure V. Uh, and for, forget this multiple point thing. Let's just say we're, we're just measuring two, two separate things. We're adding them together. We want to know errors on the one thing and errors on the other thing. When I add them together, I get some average error on F. Um, I could. I could literally, you know, histogram U and histogram V, and then add them together and histogram F. That would give me some histogram with some distribution. But I want to see if I can calculate, kind of from from some simple assumptions, what what the width of F is, based on these things. And and F could be more complicated too, right? F could be um, U to the Vth power, right? There's all all kinds of functional forms I could calculate. And here it's a lot less obvious. I have some some distribution of U's. Kind of narrowly centered around some mean and some distribution of v's, narrowly centered around some mean, and I form this uh, this exponent here, and I'll get some distribution of f's, and it should be, you know, some distribution centered around a, a mean. But I want to figure out what is the width of that distribution. So, so let's let's define these this delta f here. Uh, well, let, let me let me uh, sort of mathematicize what what I just said here. So my delta u, the thing I want to plug in to my Taylor expansion. So right now this is just a kind of abstract mathematical Taylor expansion where this is a tiny, tiny fluctuation around some, some particular value. Here I want to say that th these correspond to measurements. And so I want to have this be some, some particular measurement minus uh, u bar minus the mean. And same thing for v, I want to let delta v uh, I'm going to substitute in some particular measurement minus the, the average of all the measurements. And then the interpretation of delta F is going to be fluctuations of F you know, around, around its average minus F bar. And so this is, this is perfectly fine for, uh, for uh, the, the actual fluctuation. But what I care about is the width of the F distribution. So what I really want to know is I want to know the uh, I want to know F. Uh, I want to know like a sigma of F, right? And a sigma, a sigma, or let's call it sigma squared, sigma squared of F. This is going to be the average value of F minus F bar squared. The expectation value of the, the differences between each measurement and its mean. And so let me take this expectation value bracket and this square and, and just substitute this in. So I do partial F, partial U times delta U plus partial F, partial V times delta V. Now I have to square this whole thing and then take its expectation value. And I get a bunch of terms here. One of them is uh, partial F, partial U, uh, sorry, squared. I still, I still have my giant expectation values out here. Oh, sorry, I think I'm cutting off here. Uh, let me rewrite this a little bit. 
for some reason my my borders are not what they were before. All right, there's my expectation value. My first term is partial f, partial u squared, delta u squared, plus this term squared, partial f, partial v squared, delta v squared, plus the cross term. And here I'm going to start eating into my distribution. And remember the example I gave was just for two variables, but in general, a function could be lots and lots and lots of variables, but the same pattern holds, you're gonna get the, the self terms and then the whole mess of cross terms. Let me just list the cross terms for the simple example, df du or partial f partial du partial f partial v times this fluctuation in u fluctuation in v. And that whole thing is still inside of an expectation value. Okay, now what, basically now we have to use two properties. One is uh, the definitions of what is the expectation value of this thing. Well, the expectation value of this thing squared, u minus u bar squared, the expectation value of this thing squared, well, that's just sigma, sigma squared of u. So let me see, where do I want to put this? All right, I'm sorry, Gaussian. I was hoping to keep you around, but. Is there a factor two in the cross term, Prof. Gaussian? Yeah, but it's going to go away. So no, you're right. I should put a factor two there. Thank you. I'm just reading what's in the chat. Don't give me any credit. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, so this expectation value is linear. I can just collapse it in. These, partial val these partials are just constants that come out. So this is partial f partial u squared times the expectation value of this delta u squared plus partial f partial v squared times expectation value of delta v squared plus two times those partials, those partials times the expectation value of delta u delta v, the product of those two things. Now, our, our assumption here is that you're making independent measurements of things, and then you're performing a function on them. So small errors when you measure u and small errors when you measure v are going to be uncorrelated with each other. So you're just as likely to have a positive deviation for u uh, and simultaneously a positive deviation for v as you are to have a positive and negative or negative and negative or negative and positive. And so on average, uh, since, since these are by definition fluctuations around the mean, you're just as likely to fluctuate a little bit higher, a little bit lower. This, for uncorrelated things, this expectation value goes to zero, zero for, for un, uncorrelated uh, measurements. And we'll see, that we'll apply this to you know, literally five draws of the same thing. So those, those draws are hopefully uncorrelated. And just by definition of what those expectation values are, uh, we can say that this, this equals partial f, partial u squared times sigma squared of the first argument to the function plus partial f, partial v squared times sigma v of the second argument to the function. All right, and if you had a function that was not just two variables, but you know five variables, and you would just have a, a sum of, of five of these things. In fact, that's what I want to consider. I want to consider uh, the particular function that is, is five of these variables. Uh, okay, so let me, let me erase a whole bunch of things and I'll start with the oldest things and, and let you ask some questions. Sorry, erasing takes so long. Got a few, a few minutes left to, to prove this square root of n and um, you know, keep, keeping this propagation of error in your back pocket for the, the kinds of experiments where at the end of the day, you are calculating something based on ind independent measurements. Shouldn't the sigmas be s instead of sigma since we don't have a direct way to like calculate sigma, you said? Uh, okay, so that's a good question. The, 
if I literally have an expectation value here, then I write down a sigma. But if you wanted to, what, what is your best guess for what sigma squared is? Your best guess for what, what sigma squared is, that is S squared. Okay. So it's a little bit of a, um, I, it's, a, it's a pretty subtle distinction. And if you were to write S, S squared, it, it probably wouldn't be wrong because that's, that's the only thing you really have access to in the measurements. But uh, you know, I would say literally this, this with its expectation values is equal, 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 equal. I would not say that this is equal to S squared. I would say that your, your best unbiased estimator for this quantity is plugging in S, S squared instead of sigma squared. Is that, does that make sense? It's maybe a yeah. bit of a language thing. All right, so let's apply this to uh, apply this to the the following function, where you know y bar is one over n times y one plus y two plus et cetera, et cetera, all the way up to y sub n. So this is the definition of our our average uh, for um, well, here I have to be a little bit careful. This is again all for a single data point, so I erase this curve. But you know we're we're forming this average. So these these indices here aren't aren't independent uh, knob settings. These indices here are the five times you've gone back to this particular knob setting. Um, and I want to use all this framework here, but I want my f to be y bar, and my actual function here is just a simple sum. It's the sum of this, this measurement at that knob position plus this measurement at the knob position, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and now what I want to calculate is sigma, sigma squared of f, which is y bar. And I'm going to use this, this thing here. So again, this example was only two variables, but I can extend this on and on and on forever. So this is going to be partial, partial f, partial. Uh, y sub one squared times sigma y sub one squared, the, the spread in, in y sub one, plus dot, 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 all the way out to partial f, partial y sub n squared times sigma squared of y sub n. So if I take five measurements, I form the sum, uh, divide by n to make the average, I'm gonna have five terms in this, in this expression here. Um, okay, so what is what are each of these partial derivatives? Well, each of these partial derivatives, since it's just a sum, the coefficients are one over n. This is going to be one over n squared times, and, and what are these sigmas here? Well, again, I'm at the same point, so I, I would assume that I'm drawing from the same distribution each time. I'm just going to call this sigma the, the, true, uh, the true standard deviation for this particular uh, knob setting squared plus dot 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 you know all the way to this last term which is one over n squared times the same sigma squared. How many of these do I have? Well I have n of these. So this is going to give me uh, well let's say maybe I'll write it out in two steps just to be more dramatic. Um, n of these times one over n squared times sigma squared. This is just sigma squared over n. And now if I were to actually calculate what is, what is sigma y bar itself, which is the thing that goes on the top and the bottom to make these error bars, that's sigma y bar itself for this particular knob setting. This is just sigma over square root of n. And, and I'm sorry that there's sort of two, two indices here. One is the index of which knob setting I have, and one is the index of within a knob setting, which, which of the n, uh, Measurements I have, but you know that's going to be true in general. If you you take ten ten different data points and you do it five times, you're going to have a five by ten table. You have to deal with both. So so this is sort of using this propagation of error to prove that this these error bars are are the the uh, spread of an individual draw. Like you know what would be the spread if you if you drew a sixth data point divided by a square root of n. All right, so. That is, I think we are out of, uh, we have a few more minutes. Uh, but I would say that maybe, maybe we should start the, 
the curve fitting stuff next time. So it's all sort of self-contained. Um, yeah, I think that's fine. So maybe, maybe we'll end ever so slightly early at the cost of maybe having to go a little bit faster next time, just so I don't have to start something and stop in a few minutes. But uh, this is a great time to ask questions. Now, this is, this is really subtle stuff. I would not say that this is super fancy, high-powered math or statistics, but it's, it's, it's subtle to remember what's what and where the different ends and n minus ones and square root of ends and everything go. I guess I, I don't have a question about the material, so someone can cut me off if they have a question about that. But, but are there any um, sort of updates to um, the, the lab portion of this class that um, you know people, well, at least some people have already taken it this week, some people haven't, that like we can sort of, I don't know, like learn from others' developments there. Mistakes. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. That, that is an excellent question. I would I would let the people who have already done the lab and wish they had known something uh, speak up, or perhaps the the other two professors. Ooh, something that I didn't realize was when you import the I think it was called PyLab. When you import it, I learned this from Prof. Olson. You don't have to write like np dot like your array or so forth. You can just put the command. You don't have to say np or pd or anything. Yeah, importing PyLab like that is is kind of a bit of a cheat. It it does import an enormous amount of things, which from a you know if you're going to hand your code off to someone else, they might find annoying because like where is this function coming from? Where is this function coming from? Uh, but from a just I want to start typing and doing data analysis quickly. It is extremely convenient. But yeah, you don't have to, in the past, if you've written more, more careful code, but you've imported the, the NumPy library and you've sort of been very explicit about, you know, np.array, here you just have to say array because it has automatically imported everything in NumPy, everything in SciPy, everything in Matplotlib, uh, all at once. Oh, Jason, uh, just to confirm, the, the due date is Tuesday, February 1st. I think that is correct. I. Uh, that that's probably what I wrote. I think that's that's, that's what's on the PDF. Right. Is there is there a due time and or any format for submission? Um, yes, I think I said somewhere that the oh, format sorry. for the submission format is, is a PDF. But up the email to you uploaded to Sakai Dropbox. Oh oh, I see. Um, I I think have I set up a grade scope for this yet? I don't know. That's that's something that we we should discuss. I I was I was going to do it on grade scope. But uh, maybe, uh, does anybody have any objection to that? I'll, I don't, I haven't done grade scope for classes with multiple sections like this, but I'm sure that can be done. Uh, so let's, let's call it grade scope. If I haven't set that up yet, I will, I will set that up soon. Um, you know, this, this first one I would say is, is going to be graded mostly, mostly on completeness. Did you do all of the things and did you do them roughly right? Um, you know, I, I would be perfectly happy if, if everyone just did all of the things. And if you were a little bit confused about something, you, you asked us and we'll, we will be very, uh, uh, maybe more more generous than normal about just saying, oh, no, no, it's, this, is, this is exactly what you have to do, and here's why. Just because this is really meant to be a tutorial introduction, uh, very light practice with all this stuff before you would do it on your own data. Other questions? Comments from? Uh, the, the faculty about what what my poor students might have to suffer through this afternoon. All right. Well, I if not, I am happy to end a little bit early and really dive into how how curve fitting works and the assumptions behind that next time. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, wait, I do have a quick question. 
Yes, that would be the start. 